Our scripture reading this morning comes from Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. This can be found on page 1,567 in the Pew Bibles if you want to read along. Again, that's Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. This reads, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. morning. It's certainly good to have everyone here today. Thankful for the opportunity we have to worship God. I'm also doubly blessed this morning. My brother and his girlfriend are here with me from Oklahoma. And uh, so uh, if you have an opportunity uh, to say hello to Jeff and Kathy, they're sitting over here with Julie. Uh, uh, Well, not right now. We'll do it it at the end. But uh, so thankful that they're here, especially uh, all the other visitors that we might have with us. We want you to know that you're welcome and wanted here at the Brighton Church of Christ. And if you've not already done so, uh, please fill out a, a a card from the back of the pew in front of you that we might have a record of your attendance and if you have an opportunity to stay and say hello to the brethren here we'd love to have that opportunity as well imagine hearing a stock report something like this at the close of that's my best newscaster at the close of business the dow industrial is down or finished up 139 nasdaq is up 73 and the S&P is up 82 mostly on the strong earnings from Apple with their new iPhone devices another new earning news General Electric has fallen 108 108 and Google is down 32 and the value of the soul has plummeted to new lows and will likely never recover you imagine hearing that from a newscaster what is the value of a soul a hundred yen a thousand dollars, a million bitcoins, some of you might get that one, or is it a lie, a little greed, an insult, lust, what is the value of the human soul? It seems as a commodity, if we were to put it in those terms, that our souls are dwindling in value, it seems, every single day because of what we are willing to sell our souls for. You see, that's, that's what determines value. What am I willing to pay for something? And the question is, what are we willing to exchange for our souls? You know, Jesus once asked, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Right here in Mark chapter 8 that we read from our scripture reading this morning, but this time in verse 37. And that's a penetrating question, isn't it? It goes right to the heart of who we are as human beings, right to the heart of who we are as servants and disciples. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Or the broader context, he says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? You see, Jesus is putting an intrinsic value, a value on the soul that in and of itself, just because of what it is, where it comes from, what it does, it has an intrinsic value. And no matter how much man may belittle how much he may devalue that soul, Jesus still sees an intrinsic value. And it's important to us to value the soul the way Jesus would. And so this morning, we're going to spend a little attention on that question. But if you haven't already done so, please turn in your Bibles to that Mark chapter 8. Uh, we're, go- we're going to look at a little fuller context than just what we read uh, with, with the rebuke of Peter, get behind me, Satan. We're going to put that in its context. And why is it fit right alongside this, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And it all surrounds a, 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 a secret that Jesus imparts on the way. And so let's begin in Mark chapter 8 and verse 22. We're not going to read these. I'm going to summarize as we go through here. 
But in this instance, in Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 23 or 22, they're on the shores of the Sea of Galilee in a town called Bethsaida. And so in Bethsaida, there's a man who is blind and he is brought to Jesus. And those who have brought him ask Jesus to touch him, to reach out and touch him, to heal him. And so Jesus takes the man outside of the village and it's kind of a strange thing. You know how Jesus, he, he doesn't do things the same way every time. And in this case, he spits on the man's eyes and he's holding his hands and he's uh, holding his head and he asks him if he can see. And when the man opens his eyes, he says, I can see, but people are like trees. Everything's a little fuzzy. It's not clear. And so Jesus touches him a second time and this time everything is made perfectly clear. We, we, we read this account, and it, it, Mark includes it right here before Peter's great declaration. And I think part of it is, is uh, you know, these, these events take place in such a way as, as Mark is giving to us uh, uh, that they lead to another event. And in this case, this partial healing and then full healing of a man's blindness leads us into this great confession of Peter, who very much is, is an allusion to that, declar- to, to that uh, healing process. And so from, from this point, Mark then, uh, after the healing of the blind man in verse 27 it says that jesus went with his disciples uh, to the village of the villages of caesarea philippi it's interesting at this point mark uh he uses a phrase uh, uh several times in this context and and on through uh, is that uh, he uses the term on the way on the way on the way it's interesting because uh, Jesus is seen traveling throughout the opening pa- chapters of the book of Mark, but Mark doesn't use the, the phrase on the way. We even see it toward the end of the, the, the book of Mark, on the way. But in chapter 8, 9, and 10, that's the only place where, where uh, I'm sorry, in the, the end chapters, we don't see the phrase, but we see him traveling. But in 8, 9, and 10, he, he repeats this phrase, on the way, on the way, on the way. Stu readers might begin to wonder, well, where is he going? Is he just going to Caesarea of Philippi? But, but what we've learned is that once he gets to Caesarea of Philippi, he turns and he heads south. You know where he's going? He's going to Jerusalem. On the way, on the way, on the way. What's interesting to me is that even though he's going from Bethsaida on the, the shores of the Sea of Galilee, north to Caesarea Philippi, which, by the way, is the extreme northern limits of Jewish territory. This is where it borders with the Gentiles. And, and, and then he turns from there and he goes south all the way to Jerusalem. He begins at the northernmost, the extremities of Judaism, and he marches right into the heart of Judaism in the city of Jerusalem. And these are events that are happening on the way. And what, what I find interesting here, too, is that as Jesus is making his final journey into the heart of Judaism, he is going to the cross and the glory that awaited him there. And on the way, it says that he turns to his disciples as they are walking toward Caesarea Philippi, and he says, who do the people say that I am? And you remember, they, they answer, they say, well, some, some say that you are Elijah or, or, or that you're one of the prophets or that you're John the Baptist. There are, there's a differing opinion, Jesus, of who you are. And then he asks a more pointed question, doesn't he? Who do you say that I am? We know what the people say. We know what the polls say. But who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, and, and Peter steps up, and this is amazing, because he says, you are the Christ, what a great declaration that is because he speaks up and he calls him the Christ. Now, what's, what, what, what we need to understand is this is the first time in the book of Mark, this is the first time that the disciples call him Christ. Everything that they'd seen Jesus do so far, the healing of the sick, even the raising of a dead person, all those things, those things had, had been done by prophets in the Old Testament. Everything he had done had identified him as a prophet of the Old Testament, the preaching of the truth, the doing of these miracles. Uh, that's, that's really all they had seen. But Peter steps up. 
And he's going to go out on a limb here. And he's going to tell him, you are the Messiah that we're looking for. You are the Christ. You're that person. And so uh, uh, he, he goes further in faith than, than anyone at this point had. None of the disciples had called Jesus the Christ. Peter is the first to do it. And it appears that even though they haven't spoken up, they agree with Peter, who often was the spokesperson for the group. It's not unusual that he would be the one that would speak up. And so he is, in his estimation, he is the Messiah, the anointed one who was promised even in the old scriptures. But strangely, Jesus says to him what? Don't tell anyone. It's weird to us because you, you might think Mark or Peter, I'm sorry, you might think Peter or, or, or one of the apostles say, well, Jesus, we're, we're with you all this time so we can go and tell people who you are, right? Why would you tell us not to tell people that you're the Messiah? Why would you hold us? And it says in the ESV that he strictly charged them, do not tell anyone. What's interesting is the word charge here is really the word rebuke. It's the same word that uh, uh, Peter is going to use when he rebukes Jesus that John read for us just a moment ago. And, and when Jesus turns around and rebukes him, it's the same word. And so it says that Jesus strictly rebuked them. Tell no one about him. Now, I think traditionally we look at this and we say, well, you know, Jesus... He's about to go back to Jerusalem, and he needs his anonymity. He's going to be traveling through some of the, the, the worst parts of the country, and he doesn't want people to know who he is. But remember, uh, this, this is leading up to his crucifixion. He's already spent three years. People were coming to him because of his fame. We even talk about his early ministry, his early Judean ministry, as the time in which his fame increased. Jesus is not trying to protect his identity. Think about this, though. If he's not you know, protecting his identity, why strictly rebuke them not to tell it anymore? Is it because he did not want them to spread a false conception of who Messiah is? Like the blind man, Peter's declaration was true, but fuzzy at best, confused. He believed in a conquering Messiah, one who would ride into Jerusalem on a white horse and cracking skulls and reclaiming the throne of David. His Messiah was going to, to come in with wonder and power and miracles and, and he was going to be victorious and faithful Jews, of course, would, would come in and, and fall in behind him and flock to his banner and to his cause and they would drive out the occupying Roman force and God would protect him. God, God would secure him. God would uphold his life after all this is god's messiah god's appointed one it was a story fit for stage and cinema but the problem was it wasn't true the idea was shared by all the disciples and so when when he says that 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 uh, that jesus is the messiah and he rebukes him it says that he strictly charged or rebuked them, not just Peter, but, but all the disciples, not to reveal his Messiahship. You see, he didn't need a bunch of people confused about what Messiah is or who Messiah is and showing up with swords and, and, and ready to fall in line behind Jesus as he drove out the Romans. And this prompts Jesus then to reveal the secret, the real secret. You see, sometimes we think the secret is that Jesus is the Messiah. That's not the secret. The real secret is that Jesus would be a suffering Messiah. Notice chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and killed. He's not just Messiah, he is a suffering Messiah. The scriptures in the Old Testament spoke of the Messiah sometimes as one who was suffering. In fact, Isaiah uh, uh, verse, chapters 52 through 55, we often refer to as the suffering servant passages of Isaiah. 
because it depicts this Messiah, especially in chapter 53 that we're very, very familiar with. It depicts him as one who is suffering. At other times, it, it, it depicts the Messiah as a conqueror, as victorious, as the king. And so uh, it, it, some uh, Jewish scholars by the first century had determined that not one but two messiahs were going to come, the kingly one and the one that was going to be a spectacle to the nations. But most people, most of the Jewish people, didn't buy into the two Messiah theory, but they, they, they believed there was just one Messiah, and they emphasized his kingship. They emphasized his conquering nature. And so that became the prevailing view of the Messiah, that he would be a royal military leader restoring the fortunes and the grandeur of Israel. And they mostly ignored or diminished the suffering passages of the Old Testament. But it says here that Jesus spoke plainly. He said this plainly, verse 32. And Peter took him aside to, and began to rebuke him. It's interesting that in no uncertain terms, he says these Jewish leaders, the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the, the very ones who, if he was a conquering Messiah, if he was on that white horse, if he was carrying his sword raised above his head, they would be the first ones to recognize him as Messiah. They would be the first one to, to, to fall in line behind this conquering Messiah. They were the ones that are, going, that are identified as rejecting him and killing him because he didn't fit the mold. And so here's Peter, confused, fuzzy, misinformed, and he pulls Jesus aside because we all know we know better than Jesus, right? <laughs> he pulls Jesus aside away from Jesus' appointed round. Remember, he is on the way. Later, he's going to be on the way and on the way. What's funny about Mark when he uses that phrase on the way here in chapter 8 and then again in chapter 9 and then again in chapter 10, each time it's Jesus telling his disciples what he must suffer when he gets to Jerusalem. Here, you know, he's telling them the, 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 uh, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're going to kill him. And, and Peter rebukes him. In chapter 9, when he tells the disciples there, they start to argue over who, who's the greatest among them. It's, it's almost like it goes in one ear and out the other. But he's on his way, and Peter, Peter turns him aside, takes him off his appointed route, changes his mission, or he's trying to change Jesus' mission. Here's the subtlety and the wisdom of the devil. The devil takes one of Jesus' apostles to lead him to the cross, Judas. And he has another one of Jesus' disciples trying to lead him away from the cross, Peter. Anything he can do to thwart the mission of God. And so Peter begins to rebuke Jesus. Again, that same word, strictly charged, strictly rebuke them. We see Jesus rebukes the, the disciples. Peter rebukes Jesus. And, and, and here's the thing. Peter wanted Jesus to be the Messiah. He just wanted Jesus to be his Messiah. He wanted him to be the Messiah that was, that was playing out in the movie of his imagination. That's the Messiah he wanted, the one that was going to rise to the throne, the one that was going to make his closest disciples reign with him. Remember, that was the promise. You will reign with me. Peter's seeing this in jeopardy. If they kill you, you won't get to reign. And if you don't reign, I don't get to reign. If you don't reign, all of this is for nothing. He wants him to go to the throne. He wants him to reign so he can reign with him. Surely, the one who could calm the seas, walk on water, feed thousands with a few scraps of food, give sight to the blind, heal the sick. Surely, surely that person could not be overthrown by hapless Roman soldiers. Peter could not process the idea of a suffering Messiah, much less a dying one. And yet Jesus plainly said, 
he would die. <coughs> Unknowingly, Peter aligns himself with the devil, right? Jesus has a mission. He's got to go here. Peter has pulled him aside from that mission. Peter is telling him, you can't fulfill this mission. Don't do this. He's aligned himself with the devil. And we might think it a bit harsh the way Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. But he wants Peter to know that, that I, Jesus, I'm following the will of God. You are following the will of man. Right? Verse 33. You are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. This carnal concept of the Messiah. And in that sense, he needed, he said, he told him to get behind me, get back in line, is what he's telling Peter. You know, Jesus used this term for his followers. Followers literally get behind the leader. That's what it means to get behind the leader. His followers were to go where Jesus went, including the cross. That's the implication of a follower. Jesus is saying, get back in line so we can be on our way to our crosses. Not just my cross, but all our crosses. Now Jesus addresses the crowd then. Verse 34. He called the crowd who appears to be following at a, a little bit of a distance while he's imparting this secret of the suffering Messiah to his disciples. He calls all of them together now, and he begins to tell them, if anyone would come after me, right, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So here he gives three uh, uh, demands of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to get in line behind him as the leader. And the first one is deny yourself. Now, sometimes we will deny ourselves some things, right? You know, we're, we're on a diet, so we'll deny ourselves some chocolate, right? Or we'll make, deny ourselves other things, but not chocolate. Or we'll, we'll, we'll go on a certain fast and we'll deny ourselves access to our technology or we'll deny ourselves. Some, that's not what he's talking about. This is not about denying something to yourself. This is actually about denying yourself. It is about giving up controlling power of your lives to God. It is to learn what it means, not my will but your will be done. That's what he's challenging them. Deny yourself, take yourself out of the picture and allow God not some control, but complete and full control and access to your life. The second demand he says is to take up your cross. What's interesting here is Jesus has not been crucified yet. It's not like uh, uh, when we think of take up your cross, we're thinking of Jesus carrying his cross to the road of Calvary. And, and, and we understand the metaphor. They hadn't seen that yet. But it was not uncommon for the Romans to take the crossbar of the cross and, and lay it upon the, the victim as a burden that they would have to carry to the crucifying place or the site of the crucifixion itself. And so they would have at least been familiar with that concept. But what is he saying? He's saying, take up your cross. You are those who are, are uh, despised and doomed to death. Take up your cross. Denying self means denying self even to the point of death. And then what? Follow me. Get in line behind me. Going where the leader goes. Suffering what the leader suffers. They were not to follow in awe of his power and applaud his miracles as he taught in new places. That's not what Jesus was looking for. He, he didn't want a gallery of people celebrating his actions on this earth. He wanted followers. In Jesus' mind, he saw uh, himself being followed in a line by, by those who were carrying their own crosses and marching to the way of death, just like their leader was doing as he was on his way to the heart of of Judaism. And why? Why 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 would anyone follow a leader to the point of death? And the answer is verse 35 and 37 to 37 that heaven will surely be worth it all. That's why. Heaven is worth everything that they could possibly imagine. You see it all relates to security of life. Think about mankind 
and how we seek ways to hoard life to ourselves, to, to make it last a little longer, to hold on to the bitter end because we don't want to give up too early. Think about Peter and his rebuke of Jesus. Do you think that, that part of Peter's rebuke of Jesus may have been motivated by self-preservation? Jesus, you're going to the cross. You're going to die. And if I follow you, does that mean I'm going to die? So Jesus, don't go to death. Jesus, come in as that conquering Messiah. To truly have life, though, to save it is what he says. For whoever would save his life, if you want life, true life, great life, lasting life, don't hold on to it. Give up your life for God. That's the challenge. A living sacrifice, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Or if need be, a dead sacrifice. But giving your life to him is where you truly gain life. You see, pills and treatments may give us another day, a month, a year, or two. But giving up our lives here to let God take control gives us eternity. That's what Jesus wanted his followers to understand. That's what they needed to understand, that, 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 that in order to gain life, to truly gain the life, you've got to give up this life on this earth. And for the sake of Christ and the gospel, notice what he says. He says, uh, um, whoever will, will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, if you'll give it up for my sake and what? And the gospel's. It's not just for the sake of being my disciple, but if you will give up your life also for the gospel's sake. What does it mean to give up my life for the gospel's sake? Well, the gospel has to go out into the world. It has to be preached. If you will be my disciple and if you will give your life to evangelism, to go tell it on the mountain as it were, then you will save it and you will have eternal life. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? What profit is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What, what is worth exchanging our soul for? That? There's, there's only one answer to this question. Nothing. Nothing in this world is worth what God offers Nothing is worth eternity. Nothing is worth heaven. Nothing is worth Christ. It doesn't matter how much money the world offers. It doesn't matter how much fame, how much popularity, how much power. None of that matters if you lose your soul. And then he calls them all to embrace him wholly. They needed to stick with him and not be turned away. Notice verse 37 or verse 38. Whoever is ashamed of me... Why would they be ashamed of Jesus? Because he's not the conquering Messiah. He's the suffering Messiah who's going to be mocked and ridiculed and, 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 and killed. And he says, in, in those moments, when you are tempted to turn away in shame away from me, if you are tempted to forget who I am and what I have done, if you, if, if you are so clouded by, by your concept of the Messiah that when the scandal of the cross descends upon us, and you turn away, you are forfeiting your soul. We, we have the benefit of looking back many, many years to the events, and we know what's going to happen. We, we know the scandal of the cross. We know cursed is anyone who hangs up on a tree. We know where Jesus is. But there was a danger people to be too ashamed to follow a messiah that would be mocked and ridiculed and killed and today today we look back on the messiah and there's there's still a shame for some people to speak the name of jesus in certain circles or to follow him and of course the very next verse chapter 9 and verse 1 when he says Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. 
the kingdom of God is in hand. And he says, some of you are going to see it before you die. But you won't see it if you're ashamed of me. That's what he's saying. You won't get there if you're ashamed of me. They were willing to sell out Jesus for a better reputation. To sell out their souls for, well, for a conquering Savior. What are we willing to sell out for? This past week I had a long discussion with a young man. Converted him about a year or so ago. And he's, he's falling away from the church now. And I was talking to him, what's, what's going on? Why, why are you so ready to leave? Came down to one thing, he said. And it's, it's the lust of the flesh. He desires relations with a woman. And the elder said, you can't do this. You're not married. You can't do this. And he said to me, said to me, because we were texting, I have the quote. He said, God will either have to understand that I can't be celibate or he'll have to send me to hell. I've already decided. Why, haven't you, why aren't you fighting? Why aren't you at least trying? I don't want to. This is what I want. He, for the lust of the flesh, he's willing to sell his soul. In Mark chapter 10, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he tells him all these things. And then Jesus, he, he tells Jesus, I, I've done all those things for my youth. And he said, one thing you lack, go and sell all that you have, all your possessions, and give to the poor. And follow me. And he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had many possessions and he didn't want to give them up. The value of his soul was here, but the value of his possessions were here. You see, it doesn't have to be shame. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be lust. But the question that comes to each of us is, is what would we sell out for? Weekends at the lake? Popularity? Acceptance among some crowds or acceptance among the world? Brethren, we've got to put a proper value on our soul. The worth of a single soul. Most importantly, the worth of my soul. What is it worth to me? The psalmist would say, truly, a man, no man can ransom another or give God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he, would, that he should live on forever and, and never see the... If he, if he lived forever and gained all the money and all the power and, and all the assets and resources of the world, if he lived forever, it's not enough to buy one single soul. But we are surrounded by a world that does not see value in the soul. And here's the sad part, is if we don't value the soul like we ought to, if we don't declare that it, my soul is the greatest possession I have, it's not my house, it's not my car, it's not even my family, my soul is the greatest thing I have. If we never make that declaration, or if we can't come to that realization, then we make it easy for the devil to tempt us to turn away with that one thing. I, I don't know what that one thing is for you. I know what it is for me. I have to guard my heart for it from it. And even then, knowing what it is, the devil sometimes will catch me. You see, here's the, here's the thing is, I don't know what it is for you, but the devil knows. And if you have not determined that your soul is the greatest possession you have, you make it easy for the devil to come in with that one thing and pull you away to destroy us. But Jesus is still there on his way. And when he turns to the crowd, he's turning to us. And he's saying, lose your life from me. 
this morning? Have you lost your life for Christ? Have you given it all to him and allowed God to have complete control? That you would say, God, this is my greatest possession. I put it into your hand to protect it for all of eternity, to guard it against sin and against my own ineptness, against my own temptations. God, please take control and take care of my life. You know, you can do that this morning. All things are ready. If you believe that Jesus is that Christ, that he is calling you, that he wants to give you salvation, that he has eternal life in his hand, and you're willing, willing to lose your life for him, that's faith. Turning away from your sins, allowing him to have complete control in your life, that's repentance. And being baptized for the remission of your sins, that's, that's turning it all over to God and saying, take my life. And if you've, if you've done that and you've fallen away, you've gone back into the world, you've sold out for something and you need prayers of the congregation for strength or you, you want to come back to him in love, and all things are ready if you'll come while we stand and while we stand.